Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to welcome you to the AFC, and I'd like to present you guys with a very special documentary. And this documentary is going to talk about not only some of the corruption that's going on in Oklahoma, but maybe some of you guys in some of your counties and cities can relate to some of the things that the people are gonna talk about in this documentary. But I have to give a very special shout out to Dana Brockaway with the NAACP, as well as the Dear John, Justice or Nothing, for her to be able to take her time and put together this documentary to just kind of highlight some of the struggles and things that these people are facing and people are facing throughout the United States of America with our children and our justice system. And I want you guys to take a look at this and listen with an open mind and an open heart. You guys know that there's a lot of things that I talk about with the AFC. We advocate for our children first. We talk about things like babies for benefits and what that means and the reason I created that is because it seems like a lot of people only deal with our children and only value our children for the benefits that they can collect from our children. And that's definitely something that we wanna change in our society. And that's one thing that I push with my message. But without any further ado, I wanna present you guys with this documentary. Take a look and tell me what you guys think in the comments section. Thank you guys. So here we go. As we listen to the cries of children, our hearts naturally hurt for them. Some of those cries come from the natural events of life. Falling off a bicycle, roughhousing with siblings, not getting that extra piece of sugar and throwing a tantrum. Those cries a parent knows are fixable. Those cries are life events. As a parent, we calm the child down. The parent can comfort and hug away the pain. But what happens when a parent can't reach out to comfort their child? What happens when that pain is caused by the state agency intentionally placing children in dangerous homes? You end up with the result of countless children suffering physical and emotional abuse. My name is Dana Brockway. I'm the executive director of Dear John, Justice or Nothing. We will explore and listen to the stories of families, children, social workers, and caseworker investigators who have worked within that system. Parents who will give the accounting of hurt and harm not only to themselves, to the division of their family, but to the hurt and harm to their children. Our kids were taken on a false domestic abuse charge and uh, you know, me and my wife had some things going on in our relationship. I cheated on her. Uh, she sent me to jail behind that. Uh, DHS came and talked to us about it. They investigated. They found nothing warranting domestic abuse. Uh, two and a half months later, they came out to the home at like eight o'clock at night and they took our kids. It was for termination of my rights and my wife's parental rights uh, because DHS told her several times to file a VPO and divorce me and she said no. So uh, they told her that they would terminate her rights as well. We have lots of questions and they have not been answered. They're still not getting answered. We uh, when, when we push to get our questions answered, uh, the first thing is that I'm the aggressor. And the, th uh, the second thing is that uh, they remind us that they're pushing for termination. They're telling me I'm not doing what I need to do to get my kids. Uh, they're telling me I'm not a good father. You know, they're telling me all kinds of negative stuff and then telling me I need to be positive. It's extremely frustrating. Uh, and to add to that, now we're not good parents. Now we're this, now we have to take parenting classes. When we won the first trial, we, we never parents. had to take parenting classes. That was one thing um, they said that we were great at. Um, making sure that our kids were fed, clothed, cleaned, everything. Um, we're good parents. They appeared on my doorstep one morning out of the clear blue sky and said that uh, medical professionals were concerned that I might be causing the illnesses that she was presenting to the doctors with. She had had a string of illnesses that they hadn't been able to pinpoint a diagnosis for. She had had unexplained bleeding uh, from her stomach. She was vomiting blood. Um, she was having uh, you know, GI tract blood and she was having blood coming out of her eyeballs. Also developmental and behavioral problems which were at times quite severe. So from the time that I took custody of her at the age of about five and a half months of life, 
um, she had displayed a number of alarming traits. At first they claimed that I was that I was causing the symptoms and then they realized that there was no way anybody could fake lab tests that were showing that she had a variety of ailments. And then they claimed that it was Munchausen by proxy, which is a diagnosis that says the parent is faking the child's symptoms to get attention or sometimes to get money. When they took her from me, first of all, I fought, you know, with every ounce of my of my being. Um, their removal from my house. It was highly traumatic. They literally snatched her. She was in the hospital two days before Christmas and they um, asked me to leave the room, on, you know, to go down to the registration desk. It was a put up kind of thing. And then they had social workers and police come in and bar me from the room, leaving the child screaming, crying. I mean, screaming bloody murder and then they threatened to restrain and sedate her if she didn't stop screaming. My husband and I were separated and I was just moved into an apartment. I had been there maybe two and a half, maybe three weeks. And um, he had bought me a van, the van broke down, whatever. Um, I needed him to bring back my car, my other car. And so we had made arrangements for him to come in the morning and bring the car. Um, him and my son got into a verbal altercation that escalated with a lot of loud shouting and you know my son initially attacked my husband <laughs> with me in the middle trying to break it up that caused neighbors to call in and of course me asking for help that call initially is what led to um, the dhs social workers coming out and removing the children the boys were initially together the baby girl was alone. The oldest girl was alone. Elijah was AWOL for some time. Um, and then they eventually joined. The only time they were all together was once under kinship. The state of Oklahoma entered a settlement agreement in 2012. It was mandated to correct the hurtful and harmful actions that jeopardized the safety and well being of our children. That Pinnacle Plan agreement currently, under 2020, is still violating parents and children's rights, protectiveness, and securities. Part of that pinnacle plan says that you were supposed to have a lower caseload. Did that happen? Only for a few months. And then what happened after that few months? I've had this almost double the caseload that the pinnacle plan is asking for. They'll have supervisors move cases under vacant caseloads, which is when somebody has left the department people that would be on family medical leave, um, cases would go under there. Uh, they'd put some, you know, somebody that didn't have as many um, under their caseload, they'd move them around um, just to make it look like they're meeting the standards that they're supposed to be. It is completely unreasonable to expect that these workers can day in and day out handle a caseload that's twice the size of what a standard caseload should be. There were times that workers are up for 24 to 48 hours straight um, with no sleep and hazard conditions trying to find placement for these kids. They've been confronted previously with the uh, Pinnacle Agreement by showing uh, disproportional lawbreakers on their behalf as far as the department is concerned. And uh, this day and time, they continue to perpetuate that same type of activity. Uh, we've had numerous of families to come to us with concerns and for whatever reason, they are not being addressed. We've taken them to the highest sources in those particular departments. We've met with directors, we've met with supervisors, we've met with case managers, we've met with case workers. We've had sit down meetings with them on a regular ongoing basis and for whatever reason, we're not getting the proper justice that we think we do need and what's expected of the department. One of the larger problems that we are seeing is failed kinship or reunification. Those are structures that are paramount as a right to the child and for the benefit of a parent. Social workers say to me that they don't trust kinship placement because if the parent has problems, they say, well, that, that parent came from someplace. And so if the parent is suspect, then the grandparents or the extended family is. There's a lot of times we have viable kinship options, but we're not placing the children in that home. 
this child had not been placed back in the home with the father who had been doing everything that he asked for because the grandmother lived in the home and she had history herself. Now, the history was 20 years old and this grandmother was on oxygen, uh, had stage four cancer, um, and they simply weren't returning the home because of her 20-year-old meth charge and her own history with DHS. The father's put in a position to where he has to either move out of the home where he's taking care of his mother or not get his kid back. I'm denied kinship foster placement on my grandchild, but they gave me custody of my cousin. When I asked them when they rejected me and they gave, sent me a termination letter, I asked them, is there anything I can do? Is there any recourse I can do? Can I file another form? They said, no, there's nothing you can do at this point in time. What I do realize is Oklahoma DHS does what they want to do. I've seen them remove children from the home, return them back, and terminate the father's rights, but then the mother gives the children to the father. DHS comes back out, finds the children are not in the home, but they still allow them to live and be raised by the terminated father. There's a lot of biases within the agency um, that they have against parents. Um, if a parent speaks up for their child or for themselves, DHS looks at them as being combative with them and that they just need to um, be accountable and do what they need to do. They don't want to hear any pushback. Back to this vague, elusive behavior. Never, we don't know what that is. Uh, to me, that's advocating for yourself, standing up and having the nerve to say or point out that we're crooked. So as long as you keep doing that, we're just going to keep dragging you. And that's ultimately what that means. That's what that meant. And that's what they are attempting to do. Individual service plan. It is a tool that is supposed to be for the benefit of the parent to give them the equipment needed to be better parents. What we found is that it obstructs the benefit of the parenting in itself because it is a tool that requires money. It is the DHS policy to place them in kinship, but sometimes uh, between CASA and the court system and DHS, the parent is just overwhelmed with services. It's not realistic for them to finish their services within the six months or nine months because it usually takes two to three months to get them to understand that they have to do their services to get their children back. I met them, I, I went and visited them first time, he was about three months old, and uh, really scared me because one person, two kids, but the more that I went to go and see them, the more I adapted to being able to handle and take care of two kids at one time. And uh, we bonded, I mean, we really bonded and, and I'm, I'm still feeling real bad about it even to this day while my children are not with me. And I've done everything that these people ask me. Every time I complete a program, they throw another one out there. During the whole battery of the three-year test, I think one came back, uh, they said dirty, but then come back clean right after that. And the first one I knew was dirty with alcohol. I don't have any drug test that was dirty during the whole time that I was in there. Because when I went in there, they told me they was testing me for uh, drugs. And I'm like, okay, you know, no problem with that. And I'm working, I'm doing all field work, I'm working out in the field. So yeah, I would drink a beer in the evening or maybe have me a shot of liquor. I did that. And uh, they switched my test. Just one day I come in and say, oh no, we're switching him over to this. And that's when they got the dirty UA. But after that, they didn't get any more dirty UAs. It's, it's overwhelming, you know what I'm saying, for me to pull all that I have off into this. I think I just spent almost $50,000 and I'm, nowhere near wealthy. A lot of our clients, they don't have the financial means, they don't have the transportation that they need to get to these services. They also have to work and support themselves. And we have them going in so many different directions, they're, they're made to choose to support themselves financially or to go to services. It's just another racket and it's, it's, it's planned failure. It's absolutely planned failure. If, if, what kind of sense does it make to tell a family you have to choose between paying your electric bill and getting drug tested? You have to choose between buying food or gas to get back and forth to work and getting drug tested. It's absolutely punitive and it's also racist given the fact that 
people of color are at the bottom of the economic ladder in this country. So that might not be the way you planned it, but that's the way it is. We have to pay out of pocket for most of our services. Yes. Um, and what happens if you don't pay that money? We fail. They, they will kick us out. So for my domestic violence class uh, that I already completed, it's a 52 week course. You have to pay a hundred to get in and a hundred to get out. And then $25 for each of those 52 weeks. So that's already 200 off tops for the entrance and the exit fee. And then 25 times 52, I'm not a math wizard, but I'm thinking that's like 1500. Well, we can do the math. Yeah, I paid it the first time and completed the class, got a recommendation in flying colors. Uh, when I went to trial, the dude who wrote my recommendation, uh, I can't remember his name, but uh, he, he did not teach the class. I believe his name was Phil. He did not teach the class ever, but uh, he's the one who wrote my court reports. And, you know, at first he would write bad reports. Near the end, he wrote good reports. And then my graduation report was an excellent report. Mm -hmm. But then when he came to court, he said that he thinks I should be back in the BIT program. And after the trial, they put me back in the BIT program. I think it was a day after I had my son, so probably March 30th, they came in. They was like, okay, the birth report came back positive. I said, for what? They said methamphetamines, marijuana, and also opiates. And so when I asked her, you know, well, I don't do drugs, you know what I mean? So, you know, what's going on? She's like, I don't know. Well, we have a, um, a court order right here, take your kids. For the past three years, all my UAs have been negative. But for some reason, when I go take a hair follicle, my hair follicles from DATO come back positive. So I go somewhere else of my own choosing and my hair follicles come back negative and they're both within the same uh, time period they got harder on me they made me take class more classes which he remind you i've been taking classes the whole three years i've completed them all they made me take more classes they started more lies you know saying that you know someone in my home sexually abused him which they didn't um just pinning you know pinning everything on me that that really happened in their care Kind of take it off of their selves. I believe it's called a family functioning assessment, FFA, where I sit down with my caseworker at the time and we revise a plan. I told her everything in my life and every little thing that I've used or anything that I've endured, um, all of my problems, thinking that I was going to get help. Uh, she used that, uh, that uh, FFA assessment to create my ISP and in my ISP there were a lot of things that needed to be done, um, I will say that, but then there were a lot of things that were put on there that I don't believe should have been allowed and I, I at this time now feel like that it was put together to overwhelm me. I needed to get my dental work um, done and completed. Uh, I need to pay down all of my fines to get my children back. I um, need to get on birth control. CASA workers and permanency workers almost work together, almost going on a witch hunt to find reasons to not reunify a child or keep a child in the home with a biological parent. What we have found is that children are allowed to go out of state with journeys to foster homes. What we have found also is that those journeys are actually covering the hurt, harm, and abuse to those children in the system. I'm not sure if it was Arizona or Mexico, but they had my children wanting to go out and do a bloom festival. And when the case manager brought it to me, I objected, I denied to it right off the bat. And the case manager kind of said, well, you know, I got to take this to the judge and they're going to probably approve it anyway. And pretty much, yes, they did. She called me like on a Wednesday or Thursday and they were supposed to be leaving that weekend. And they went and talked to the judge and he approved it and it was gone. Without your consent? Without my consent, I told them that. Without you even physically in court? Without me in court, yes. You know, being here in the state of Oklahoma and going through the system, you get a lot of that. That's almost like a norm around here, that you're cut out of the picture and they just do what they want to. Um, there's multiple reasons why I don't consent, but yes, they have um, asked 
for them to go out of state. Several times. Yeah. We reported to DHS, and then they came to my sister's house and harassed her through phone calls and even in person and told them, we're going to remove the kids. The very next day, they removed the children, and then they were placed in a non-traditional foster home in which the judge allowed them to travel to New Mexico with this family uh, that's outside of tribal boundaries, number one, and it's outside of the state of Oklahoma. And... Um, yeah, he just, if they said, if you don't consent, we'll just rule over it. And that's ultimately what happened. In 2012, the Pinnacle Plan was instituted as a civil rights class action lawsuit. Currently, in 2020, we still find that civil rights and due process and retaliation are alive and well. Because it's been going on for so long, lawsuits have been brought, lawsuits have been won. The Pinnacle Plan isn't working. I can say there are way too many hoops for people to jump through. There are made up hoops for them to jump through. And I think that a lot of people within the department have their own biases and they add that into the situation as well. And it's very hard for everyday folks to follow a statute or follow protocol when the goalposts are always being changed. Too often, too often, even now, let's have another meeting. And 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 the situation and circumstances are all still the same. Uh, let's have another meeting. You think we might be, uh, let's reschedule a meeting. That's another problem. You know for a fact that somebody has done everything and the children were not reunified? I do. And what did you yourself do about that? I fought for the client. We uh, appealed it up the channels of DHS, and we, I was overruled and was uh, told what to say as far as termination and why. So you're coached into what to say in court? I think everyone is coached. Uh, all the workers are coached what to say. The parents aren't given due process. They just uh, aren't given a chance to reunify, and that's our process is to unify the children with the kinship. Uh, so I do believe that some have been violated. I've had cases where they uh, were violated. According to court order, until she turns 18, if I have any contact with her, they will arrest me. I did not have a court reporter. I asked for one, and the judge said, first of all, you'll have to pay for it, and second of all, we'll have to reschedule, and it'll be three months out before we can get another hearing with a court reporter in here. We don't do court reporters. And I said, can I record it? with my phone and the judge said, no, you may not. That is not allowed. Um, my a worker was assigned where they went to the hospital. It was a new baby born. However, the parents already had a child that was in DHS custody and in foster care. Um, I was the supervisor at the time when my worker showed up at the hospital. There was a family there, balloon signs, excited to adopt the baby. They had an attorney. They were ready to adopt and move forward. Later, to find, come to find out, um, the sibling who was in DHS custody was placed in a traditional foster home, not in a kinship foster home. I ended up advocating that this child was safe and learned from the potential adoptive parents that they have been trying to get in touch with the worker since they learned about the first child being born and was never able to get a call back because they were willing to take that child too. My district director had both children placed in the traditional foster home, which the adoptive parents went and fought. I spoke to the DA and let them know about the kinship option, and I was retaliated against for speaking out. I was told that the forensic investigation came back inconclusive and the DA declined to press charges, um, but DHS, because they're a separate entity, can do what they want, and they decided to substantiate it and say that it was all true. I was told that during the time that Jennifer Bloom was my caseworker, that there was nothing that I had completed in my file. So what the judge saw looked like I had done nothing. But you had completed uh, a lot of it. A yes, a lot of your ISP. Mm -hmm. A lot of the classes and and um, substance abuse evaluations, mental health evaluations. Besides that one negative, um, my very first mental health evaluation, they saw that one because they, they kept presenting that. Um, when that took place, 
Jill did make quite a few comments about that because it was stated in there in my mental health evaluation, that first one, when I was going through psychosis, that I was borderline personality disorder. And she kept um, arguing the fact that I have borderline personality dis disorder and that's a s really serious um, diagnosis and um, basically how would I care for children with a, a diagnosis like that, that it's serious and I would need serious help. I mean, there's been multiple times in court where she she yelled um, this one specific time. I remember she was saying, over her dead body, will I ever get my children back? Um, and that Jeremy and I are the worst parents she's ever seen in her entire life. She actually um, said that to the judge. When you hear of these stories, you will hear very graphic and detailed accounting of abuse to children. You will hear that within that foster care system, nothing was done you will hear things that you don't want to hear, but we will appeal to you that the only way to learn is to listen. There's so many, so many visits you can make in a month, and we want them to be quality visits, and that's supposed to be recorded. And I think many times it's not recorded properly. So yes, there is a chance that a child could be abused if you have a large caseload. I've seen consistent head injuries throughout this the multiple homes that I've seen my kids go in and out of, uh, I see consistent head, face um, injuries that should be documented accordingly. I should have documentation of these injuries that I'm seeing on my kids and I'm not getting that. Bumps on their genitalia mm -hmm. that uh, when we ask about, you know, please just come to our visit and take our kids away and then we don't get any answers other than yeah, there was no uh, molestation going on or, you know, stuff like that. But back when it first started, we would undress the boys because they would have bite marks on their backs or bite marks on their nipples and, you know, just bruises all over their body. So we would bring, and they would come in dirty diapers, you know, poopy diapers. So we would, the first thing we did when we saw our kids is we would check them out full forensic exam, get them naked, check them out, ask them how they're doing, get them fresh clothes and fresh diapers, and then we'd get to playing with them and talking to them. But uh, to us, it was we were concerned about our children, so we were looking after their safety. And uh, DHS chastised us about doing that. You could see the fear and the discomfort in his eyes and the pictures. He's just not the same, you know. Uh, it, it's not an injury, but one of the homes he was placed in, they were painting his fingernails and telling him he's a girl. And uh, the current home he's in, they tell him to call the foster, the foster lady mommy. And so when we see him for that one hour every two weeks, I have to deal with my son telling his biological, his mother, his mom, that he's not, or she's not his mommy, you know, Stacy is. That's something that's damaging mentally. Uh, physical abuse, my son has come to me with giant knots on his forehead, you know, like hematomas, big ones. There was a case um, just before I got it. Uh, two weeks, they had closed it. It was an infant, and the mother was in the hospital, um, had a lot of erratic behaviors, and um, she also, she had tested positive for Xanax and marijuana. Our night unit, which we call the true unit, went out initially. The case was transferred later to a worker. That worker couldn't find the mom, finally followed up and closed the case. Um, at that time, you know, they were sending emails every day, every couple of days. Uh, she didn't get the medical records. Um, and in those medical records, it had a lot of very important information where the nurses were calling the true unit. They talked to the true unit supervisor. Um, they couldn't get a hold of the worker and the supervisor said, I don't care, basically, I don't care. Um, they were talking about the mom's very, very erratic and concerning behavior. They didn't want to send the baby home. They sent the baby home. 15 days later, I got called out to that joint response with law enforcement the baby's um, skull had been crushed in half. Um, I had serious concerns for the mother's um, behavior and uh, substance use. And so when you go back in the history and you see 
nobody addressed, you know, the long time issue with Xanax use, but that's what we're back here for. And now I'm not, you know, I'm not investigating bruises. I'm investigating a death. And we closed this case two weeks ago. The husband of the wife who was fostering them at the time had beaten my two-year-old baby while he was fresh out of the bathtub naked. And we saw belt scars across his belly. And we said, ah, that's why he didn't, they didn't come with the others. They waited weeks to heal. And my son came back with pink eyes so bad it spread through his face. Um, he said that they, he wouldn't eat peanut butter. And we asked him why, he said, cause you're trying to trick me. And we said, what do you mean? He said, the guy's name, and it, which was the parent, the husband. What was his name? His name was <laughs> And that you're trying to trick me like <laughs> He said, it's, that's boo boo. And then we go, no. And he, and he said, who, what are you talking about? He said, <laughs> try to trick me with <laughs> boo boo. That's my other son. Um, and try to feed him feces like it was peanut butter. My four-year-old told us after like a week of coming that um, that he and his brother were sexually abused in the first foster home within those 30 days by older children. Um, I, I can't say that they were sexually abused by adults. I wouldn't know that part, but he did say that there was another little boy that would touch on them and, you know, put his penis in his mouth. And he said, that's why we got our own room. So that lets me know they were sharing a room with an, other children. Um, I witnessed during one of my visits, finally after I achieved visits um, at my sister's home, um, my two-year-old would throw tantrums, they came back extremely angry and, you know, just ill-behaved, not like they were before. He would get naked um, and he'd take off his clothes and he would put his finger in his butt. And when I would bathe them, they would touch each other. And that's some things I noticed that well, my daughter, she was seven and she let me know that she didn't tell me about sexual abuse, but she was with a elementary school teacher here in Oklahoma City, a principal. I mean, not teacher, principal, excuse me. And the lady would starve her and beat her in her back. There was another home where she said that there were other girls there and the lady would allow them to fight like like it was battle royale you know um, and then lock them in the laundry room um, so those are some things that um, I do know uh, from them telling me and then everything else would have been disclosed in visits because they were removed after that point they didn't want me videotaping but I didn't listen because it is part of my First Amendment rights. So what they did is begin to make the visits therapeutic amongst their own providers. And even if the kids did say something, which just happened before, while they're in there, they, nothing happens. There's no, they're still in the same, they, they remained in the same home, actually after they disclosed right in front of the caseworkers. I know that my one-year-old daughter was sexually abused because of what one of the workers said that oh she's not walking she's taking steps and stumbling she wasn't doing that um with me and that she screams during diaper change like she's dying and this is the words that were said um and i know that to be true when i saw her 30 days later she was stumbling and couldn't keep a grip so that lets me know something's happened At first, like, it was just, I was just doing it, you know, to, like, get, like, basically, like, you know, eat and stuff, you know. Like, I see my mom here and there, and she'd, like, give me some food or, like, 
something like that, but she couldn't really just. You mean during like, she was able to visit you? Yeah. And then? Like she'll like basically drop some money off somewhere and make sure it gets to me or something like that. Sometimes, yeah, there's sometimes, there's like enough food. And I mean like in the Berry house, like it, they change it up. It used to not be enough food. I mean, but it, it depends what you get. Sometimes you get a sandwich. Some kids get slapped out of nowhere. You know, it just be like, you know, older kids thinking they like, you know, could pick on younger kids and stuff like that. I I got into like, I fought like at one placement, I fought like six different people. Cause like everybody in the placement was like, you know, mad, you know, angry cause they parents died or something, you know, so. It, it had like a different, a lot of emotions, different personalities. When I was in jail, like I would get like more days in there cause like they didn't have nowhere to take me. So like if I was like my, I was supposed to get out like I did a month, like it was three, three weeks. I did three weeks and I was supposed to get out in a, a, a like, that in them three weeks, but I had to wait like a, a extra few weeks because a few times uh, just because I was in DHS and they had to find places and stuff like that. Do you want to talk to me about it? Not really. Not really. Not really? Yeah, but I'll talk. They used to strangle us against the wall, depending on how much you pushed back, they used to get another staff, and then they used to give you a shot through your butt, and I couldn't walk or sit down. They used to like paint my nails and stuff, and then I used to suck my thumb. I just didn't like it, because it would make my skin come off and stuff. The way it hurts you was because getting strangled against the wall, then getting shot back, Will hurt a lot. Missed your mom? Yep, a whole lot. Every day I would pray, see if I would go home. Did you, were you able to talk to your mom when you were at the foster home? Um, no, not unless I went to. Only the time I would talk to her was like, I had to visit. Every time she'll, every time she goes there, she'll give me gifts. And we'll talk. At the end, when it's time to go, we'll start crying. When you're dealing with a system or an entity as large as what we're dealing with, you have to remember absolute power corrupts and people in power want to retain that power. Money and corruption go hand in hand, and this is no different. So if they take our rights and we lose our kids, we have to pay for it in back child support. If we retain our rights and we get our kids, we still have to pay for it and back child support, but we are being billed through our children's names. So it's Medicaid paying for it currently, but whenever this process is over, we still have to pay for it out of pocket. It's a national problem. It's a national problem. Yeah, I'm willing to bet you anything. If we tap any state in the country, they're running on some of the same problems. It's a business and they look at it as generating money for them versus advocating and doing the right thing for the kids or the families. It's intentional, it's not accidental. We don't know who's orchestrating it, but who's ever in charge has been notified, has been contacted, is aware of what's going on, and they fail, fail, fail to correct it. That's the problem, our system is broken. You need to check on all of those that they've held to that point to where they're just eligible to be adopted. That's the problem. If they know there's a time frame on them and they keep them to that time frame in order to adopt them, that needs to be investigated. That's a problem. The higher up you go, the more separation there is. Um, and I think the co-neutrals, you know, they speak to the higher ups who want the co-neutrals to think that everything is fine. The amount of money that the co-neutrals are getting paid, you would expect they'd spend a little bit more time doing that job. There's corruption from the top to the bottom. First of all, it's a money-making scheme. There's a lot of money. Just as there are money in prisons, there are money in, there is money in the child welfare system. DHS is, I, I think, 
the, the third largest organization or second largest you know, organization in terms of, of where our money is going as a state, just behind corrections in terms of, of where money goes. I just believe that um, that system is designed to oppress. It is a racial bias, obviously, that exists, and they want to hide and cover up uh, what they've done and are doing uh, to parents, to children, grandparents, and family. And I feel like, you know, the door is closed to keep that secret, to keep that quiet. We've had some parents believe that there is a, uh, the equivalence of maybe a pedophile wing, for lack of better wording, that is a word that some of them have used um, when their children are all of a sudden getting approval to grow across state lines. Um, would you believe that corruption runs that deep? It would not surprise me. I have filed grievances before, um, and the grievances are handled also within the agency. Um, I have filed very specific grievances of people who have witnessed certain events. Um, I know that those witnesses weren't talked to, um, things weren't discussed, and it just got swept underneath the rug. I feel like a lot of people within the agency feel like they're untouchable because they've been able to get away with it for so long. My granddaughter was a fatality in a car accident. And so she left a three-year-old daughter. Mm -hmm. I seek custody, and I was granted the custody. It was a lot of money involved because of the car accident, and so she did, it was a settlement for my great-granddaughter. Mm -hmm. uh, she had um, not received the, uh, the settlement at that particular time, but she did, uh, they did allow for her to, um, they told me to seek Social Security, which she would be survivor. Judge Kirby, appointed a, someone to probate my great-granddaughter's estate. So in the process of probating, they had stored her Social Security, so she went back to the judge and said, I need, she wanted uh, authority over our Social Security. And she told me to send it to the bank, and of course I told her, uh, Social Security does not allow me to put someone else's name on the account, only the child and myself, because she was in my custody at that time. She continued to go behind closed doors to the chambers and ask the uh, judge what, for whatever she wanted. Well, when she became the guardian, she went and I was threatened with the Social Security by the judge. And it's in a statement. And he said, if you do not sign this over to her, I will put the child in DHS. I am tired of you. About a third of her money has been taken so far. For, for what? For legal fees. And that the child hasn't incurred. Yeah, no, the child hasn't incurred any legal fees. It's the attorney's legal fees. Everything that they say in their mission, they did totally opposite to me. They kept me away from my kids. They kept them from uniting with their family. They tried to keep us from bonding, you know. So everything that they say, that they get their money from the federal government for it, that they're doing, their child care system, it's written in my jacket. You can go through the files and see that everything that I've done and everything that they're supposed to do, and they did op absolutely the opposite of it. It's sad to say, but we have to prepare our young men for dealing with society, and I don't think that that family's equipped with teaching him how to protect himself, how to behave, how to act, how to deal with some of the discrimination, the prejudice that he'll incur in life. This exists across the board. Rather than punitively removing children why don't you provide family support rather than punitively going in like the Gestapo? And, and, I, and I'm not saying that hyperbolically. For social workers and police, armed police guards, to sweep in, scoop up a screaming child. I have seen children literally snatch from their mother's arms screaming. Mother screaming child screaming, mother fighting for her child as any mother would. We know that foster care is a literal pipeline to failure, which includes a prison cell and a number on your back. We know these things, this is a fact. The number of children that matriculate from foster care with good outcomes is so minuscule that it would be laughable if it weren't such a tragedy. And we also know that there are states 
and nations that do this better. Stop building prisons, start building therapeutic intervention programs. Start understanding that when you go into a household and it's filled with a bunch of aunties and cousins and uncles and everybody is hollering and everybody is happy and there's a fifth of henny on the table does not mean that the family is dysfunctional. That does not, that is not a sign of a dysfunctional family. That's the way families function. We take care of each other and sometimes that looks chaotic. But what looks chaotic to a non-culturally competent person from the outside is in fact the way black people navigate the rough waters of America. Ultimately, they're the future. <laughs> You're creating monsters. You are abusing parents. Get rid of the crooked people in there and really do this state a service. Be a department of human services. And first, you have to treat people like humans, no matter what the color is. I think some of it's financial. Um, I believe some of it is the department not wanting to admit to mistakes that they're making and cover up. Um, kicked out of meetings and had meetings occur behind my back um, where misinformation was given to the DA or to the judge. I think it is time that the department looks at itself and is accountable for where it's failing and takes steps to correct those conditions because it's going to continue and the cycle is going to continue. Speak out. Um, I know it's hard, um, but the persistence of evil is for good men to do nothing. And our job as social workers, as child welfare workers, is to advocate for these kids and these families that don't have a voice. We are their voice.